John Kramer. My name's John. Jigsaw, morally gray enough to be a Batman villain. When last we saw this death-inducing Thomas Edison, he was yoga posing in a bathroom with heartthrob Adam the Spy. If you want to know more about that particular exchange of words, Game over. you can check out my previous video. We discovered that Jigsaw's budget for the first Saw movie was reasonable and achievable. But now the stakes have risen. Jigsaw's finally conscious for a film, and he's crafted an H.H. H. Holmes house of horrors. So, how does our favorite civil engineer slash real estate mogul slash architect slash serial killer fare this time around? Can he beat his budget from the first movie? Or does the receipt for Saw 2 collapse Jigsaw's bank account like a housing market crash? As always, a few caveats worth noting. Just like last time, I'm not going to charge Jigsaw for thrifting scrap off his pre-existing properties. If he wants to tear apart a warehouse for metal scraps so he can build, let's say, a theme park of pain, that is within his jurisdiction. Likewise, I'm not going to charge him for his utilities. He can have as much water as he wants. Much appreciated. We're looking for new purchases explicitly for the purposes of traps. We're also dealing with how much these items cost in the year depicted in the film. So for Saw 2, that's 2005. Prices for things inflate and deflate differently over time, so it's easier for me to pull these numbers from the time they're depicted in. This will come into play more in the future when time skips start happening and competing budgets begin to emerge in the Saw franchise. So. Did Jigsaw break the bank by raising the stakes? Or did this revenge-laced retiree dodge the tax man? Let's do Jigsaw's accounting and find out. The movie begins with Mike. Hello, Michael. Actually, the movie begins with a new light bulb. Oh, wait, there's a bunch of fresh lights in this room. It looks like there's some vertical lights in each of the corners, one above the door, and some overhead spotlights. Mood lighting is not native to warehouses. I'll permit the installed light above the door, and I'll even allow the installed spotlights on the ceiling. But the lights in the corners I am going to charge for, as well as that central bulb hanging down. If the man wants his room lit up, that's gonna cost around $41. Anywho, we start with Mike, who's in a bit of a bind. Well, it's more like a Venus flytrap. Think of it like a Venus flytrap. The construction of this trap is similar to the reverse bear trap in that it is primarily found stuff, but there are a few parts and pieces that are too new and unique to not count. Across Mike's chest, as Billy explains, are three master locks, affixing the Venus flytrap to his body with interlacing leather straps. The locks are new, as is the key under Mike's eye. Lowe's sold these in bulk for about $34 in the early 2000s, and the price didn't drift that much from the first Saw film to the next. We'll keep that price that I gave in that video, so around $34 for the bundle. But I'm curious about that leather. It doesn't look like a generic leather harness, particularly with the placement of those locks, so I'm going to tally that under the purchases, $30 or so for leather. As for the flytrap itself, at first the metal on the interior caught the light, making me think it was some sort of new material, but Upon closer inspection, it's just shiny, rusted metal, however that works. Here's a debate for you. I don't know how easy it is to thrift an iron face mask. Uh, then again, I don't know how easy it is to construct a cast iron face mask. It's definitely easier to find one and build a trap from it, so I'll assume Jigsaw did that. Let's say this much. There's also a line of steel cabling leading to a little pulley that's been installed into the wall. Jigsaw is super into pulleys in this movie for some reason. But what I'll do is charge for a 50-foot spool of steel cabling that Jigsaw can use throughout the film. As for the pulleys, I've identified this one as a single groove with a bearing, swivel eye for 3 16 inch diameter rope. Jigsaw would purchase fresh pulleys because he needs them to be reliable. I found a pulley that I'm fairly certain matches the one that's used in the scene with Mike. Well, these days, a pulley like this costs as low as $6, and back in the 2000s, before cheap manufacturing swept the nation, these parts could go for as high as $34 a piece. I found this pulley sold by Ace Hardware from 2005 to 2007 for $34.11, so we'll use that price for this 
and future pulleys we see. I'm also gonna count the scalpel Jigsaw provides Mike in his lunchbox, and the VHS tape and VCR that our boy Billy is broadcast from. Instead of charging for every VHS tape that we come across, I'm gonna charge Jigsaw the standard price for a pack of two blank VHS tapes. And let's say he got five of those for a total of 10 VHSs. That covers all the tapes we encounter in the movie. I don't know what model VHS player is being used for playback, but we do get a good look at Jigsaw's VHS players of choice later on in the film, so I'll use that model range here. Some people think you can thrift any old TV and it'll work perfectly. These people have not fished TVs out of a junkyard. If you've personally found a working TV in a junkyard in 2005, let me know down below. In the meantime, this TV costs $50. Mike gets stressed out by all this and finds himself with a piercing headache, as do we all, bud, and he collapses to the floor. Mike's body is looked over by his best friend, Detective Eric Matthews, fresh from his breakup with his son. Matthews got called out personally for this one with a message just for him. Look closer, Detective Matthews. You see, Mike was Matthew's favorite snitch, and Matthews is quickly becoming Jigsaw's favorite playmate. Some good old-fashioned detective work later, Matthews has figured out where Jigsaw lives. Surprise, it's in another warehouse. Matthews' goon squad roll up bold, right up until Billy rolls down on them in some dramatic lighting. For this cage, I'm gonna say that it was part of the building. I'd argue that Jigsaw wired it up to be a trap, but the cage counts as existing structure that he added onto. In a classic Home Alone-esque goof, our first SWAT goon loses his footing. Ow! This activates the mousetrap cage, zapping the lads dead. For this arrangement, I'm gonna have to charge for a new Billy. While he was whole when we saw him congratulating Amanda, Adam did go on to beat the crap out of him with a baseball bat. Bad roommate. These repairs take materials, and those materials cost money. Billy's dramatic entrance also involved a spotlight, which, like, dude, fabulous. The loose step happens fast, but if we slow it down, we get a great look at some of the hardware involved. It looks like we've got some more of that steel cable, another pulley, this time a double path pulley, but only one path is being used, a large spring, like maybe a car shock, and some pieces of metal. It looks like the trap is pretty simple. The weight of the person puts tension on the steel cable, which pulls the pin out from the mechanism holding the step up. The step collapses down, and a large heavy plate slides forward into the shins of the cop. The spring might be holding the weight of the step so it doesn't trigger too soon. It looks like the weight of the cop pushed the plate forward, or at least bends his legs backward. Yeesh. Giant plate of steel could be forged. The rest is definitely bought. We're looking at parts costing Jigsaw about $294.11. His companions are almost as unlucky, if not more so. Well, they die, so they're definitely more unlucky. The cage seals shut behind them, and the walls become electrified. As you'll recall from my first Saw video, I don't charge for electricity, but I do charge for electrification. So we're looking at the same cost as the wiring used to zap Gordon and Adam, plus the mechanisms needed to shut the gates. The rest of the goon squad is understandably upset and charge the castle, where we are introduced to a very spicy jigsaw in the middle of some soup. Yum. As the coppers storm the joint, we get a few sweeps of Jigsaw's current workshop. This is quite the upgrade from the little desk we saw in the last film. Let's break it down as best we can. Jigsaw can keep the kitchenette and any supplies directly related to managing his cancer. The American healthcare system is a trap, but it's not a jigsaw trap. Not yet, anyway. We've got some interesting projects in the works, including what looks like a birdcage trap? There's a fair amount of aluminum here and a lot of pieces of wire cabling running throughout. I'm not sure if this is an art project or a trap, but I'm gonna say it's a trap since we do see John working on schematics of it throughout the film. I'll let you decide what it is and what it becomes while I figure out how much it costs. Sourcing a sheet of aluminum and some wiring kits, all in all, that's about... $140, let's say. Next, we've got what looks like a mannequin head wearing a respirator, like what you'd see from somebody working with intense chemicals. It's suspended in what looks like a chemistry stand with some wires strung across its forehead. Next to it is the dial from an old rotary phone and an old serial input device for a computer. I can't tell exactly what I'm looking at there, but it looks like it might be related to chemistry and physics. Next to that is a car battery, some assorted bits of appliances strung around it. 
we also get a shot of what looks like a mannequin head demolished by a reverse bear trap, and some gears that look like they may have been used in some trap creation. It's pretty cool to see. Also, I'm not charging for the mannequins. He can have them. He can keep them. I'm good. There is a hospital body lift machine, normally called a Hoyer lift. These are not cheap and are not typically given out freely, but some insurance can cover them for at-home assistance. The problem is, John isn't using it for moving himself around, but we do see that he's in a wheelchair. Because it's medical equipment being used for trap production, however, I'm going to charge for it. It's currently suspending a mannequin leg inside a plastic box full of syringes. How prescient. We also get a look at some more computer equipment at yet another station, and in front of it is a body bag with a hose going into the head? I'll just say he probably found the hose, that's fine. And the bag might be homemade or found. But that computer in the back will cost him. We might have a recreation of Paul's trap from the first saw as well, with mannequin parts tossed inside. The metal grating and barbed wire look less fresh than the trap in Saw 1, so we'll say it's reused from the first film. That's that entire half of the studio, a menagerie of traps in the making and traps since made. The other half of the room is tough to see, we don't ever get too good of a look at it. We've got some sort of rolling cart covered in tools and hardware, a number of workstations, and at least three lamps. A lot of the furniture was likely from the warehouse itself, though that rolling cart is suspiciously clean looking. Best I could find for something like that was around $45. I understand there's a lot of books, paper, pens, drafting materials. Some of this might be left over from his career. Some of this might have been left over from the construction sites. And I can't really get a good angle on everything to know what's being used for traps and what isn't. I do remember in grad school I'd regularly be buying new pens and paper and notebooks and such, so I'll do an average and charge for a semester of supplies. It's the best I can do. Let's say $300. John gets more acquainted with Matthews and tries to introduce him to the concept of conversation. Matthews is resistant, instead storming off to Jigsaw's new streamer room. Here we are greeted with, oh my god. Okay, I'm putting my foot down. This man has an AV electronics hobby, and some of this stuff is so old he might as well have grabbed it from a hospital basement. Some of it is beyond my ability to identify. I'll do the best I can, but for anything I can't find a price for or able to identify, we're just going to assume it was Christmas gifts or something. So, we've got these two upright cabinets on the left, and we've got these shelves in the back, as well as some large desks in the foreground. Inside the cabinets, there's an oscilloscope, two ATIS CG100 document recorders, an Agilent power supply, an analyzer I can't identify, and what looks like a vitals monitor. In the other cabinet, there's what appears to be a data input analyzer, another oscilloscope, an unknown power supply, and an EMI power supply. On the back wall, I can spot three different voltage monitors, a frequency analyzer, three unidentified power supplies, the back of a data input or analysis machine, an unplugged CRT monitor, a wave analyzer, a pump frequency manager, a third oscilloscope, an unknown frequency analyzer, and I think that's an old security camera monitor. Well, given the nature of this film and its grand trap, I'm honestly not surprised by the amount of lab equipment Jigsaw has around here. But this is quite the collection. Finally, the piece de resistance is unveiled. Eight CRTs, seven of which are lit up, displaying what appears to be a live feed from a VHS security system, starring Matthew's estranged son. Oh yeah, the box at the end of the table is a rack mount reel-to-reel -reel player. I think we see this machine in a future film as well, but I'll add my best guess for its cost here now. Somewhere in the room are the computers receiving feeds from the remote location of the trap house. We're familiar with this setup because it's similar to what Jigsaw arranged for Zepp in Gordon's house, just scaled up. We can charge for that base computer like we did in the last video, times 7, but also bump up the price for some CRTs that were on sale. Yes, in 2005, CRT monitors were still in high demand. That brings the grand total of this gamer rage cage to $14,535. 
Now that's a setup worth having. Matthews is visibly upset seeing his son on an episode of Big Brother and goes to confront Jigsaw. Jigsaw decides to get super duper cheeky as he explains. It's your son Daniel, you remember him, don't you? <laughs> Jigsaw has kidnapped Daniel and is holding him hostage in a trap house. After getting really graphic about what's in store for Daniel, with a gas creeping into his nervous system and he begins to bleed from every orifice he has. There will be blood. Matthew's puzzle begins to emerge. His goal is to rescue his son. I don't know why he's freaked out though. Daniel's perfectly safe. He's in a safe place. See? Cheeky boy. Also, spot that fresh clock on the wall. Matthews tries to call his son, but Daniel has one of those awful spoof voicemail lines. You've reached Daniel's phone. He's not in right now. God, what a nerd. Anyway, Matthew's grief pulls us directly into Daniel's suffering and we transition into the trap house. The first room features our cast of cantankerous ex-convicts. Xavier, professional asshole. Jonas, he seems nice. Addison and Laura, not really sure what's going on with them. Obi, he scares me. Gus, I don't know about Gus. And Daniel, who we've met before. And someone with short hair, I don't recognize her. Oh wait, it's Amanda! and she is freaking out. While Amanda frantically searches the room, let's tally up what we can see here. We've got a security camera in the corner, visual only, as well as a big honking safe in the middle of the room. After speaking to some friends in antiquities, these safes can be bought cheaply if you're not needing them to work. Since we know this safe actually works, it's gonna cost extra. As Amanda panic cleans, she uncovers the most ominous invitation of Jigsaw's, the micro cassette tape. Everything you need to know is on this. Just in case it hasn't been said before, I'm gonna go ahead and charge for a whole pack of micro cassettes, and then we'll just assume that all the tapes that come up were purchased from that pack. So, purchase covered. Jigsaw explains that in three hours, the door to the house will open, but in two hours, they'll all be dead due to a nerve agent they've been breathing in. Those of you familiar with the Tokyo subway attacks will know its devastating effects on the human body. So this complicates things a little, but not how you'd think. Jigsaw is referring to the 1995 sarin gas attacks perpetrated by the Amshinrikyo cult in Tokyo, Japan. The cult synthesized sarin successfully in a lab at a small scale, then spent years ramping up their chemical and biological production facilities to produce tons of the stuff. Here's how it gets complicated. How does one budget the manufacture of laboratory grade sarin gas without upsetting anyone or getting arrested? By saying it's $15,000 and not opening up the door to debate. Speaking of doors, this one's a bit overzealous. It's got a keyhole, a peephole, it's bolted super securely into the frame of the wall, and it's extremely reinforced. Alongside the micro cassette recorder is a key and a note. Do not attempt to use this key on the door to this room. Fuck this, man. this does not prevent the stars of the Full House reboot from exploring the door thoroughly, and we discover that the door is armed and dangerous. Hi, Gus. So this door is a little tricky to nail down. On the one hand, Jigsaw might be adept at thrifting parts from his many warehouses. On the other hand, he doesn't want something that will just fall apart, so he needs materials he can rely on. And finally, we do see a blueprint of one of the doors later in the film, which means we know Jigsaw spent time designing these doors and taking care to understand their construction. Given Jigsaw's proclivity for the dramatic and choice of finer materials, I'm going to say he purchased new materials for the installation of this door and door frame. So in researching this, I came across a company that builds vault doors for fancy houses. In 2023 prices, construction and installation are $9,900. Best estimate for 2005 prices is around $6,300 or so. Assuming Jigsaw handled his own installation, he probably paid around $2,200 with the included mechanisms to automatically open the door. This isn't the only door in the house either, so when we see one, we'll add it to the tally. The gun, gears, and chain are easier to nail down. The gun is possibly a Ruger G161 or G141 357 Magnum, but either way, that makes it $541 brand new. For the chain and gears and the metal to mount it to the door, I'll tally up to approximately $55. Gus decides to take a nap and everyone is freaking out for a bit, and we transition back to Matthews and the Goon Squad. 
Kramerbot tells Matthews he wants to try talking again. Get back to the way things were, just the two of them. Matthews is hesitant, but caves into Jigsaw's pleadings. Back in the room, the Babysitter's Club is trying to decode Jigsaw's message. Just as things come to a head, the door unlocks itself clunkily. And we move into the hallway. Xavier tries the tiny key on a locked door, but to no avail. There's actually a few locked doors in this house. I'm not sure if they were meant to be open sequentially or what, but we never get to see what's inside those rooms. Shame. I like to think everybody in the house had a trap ready for them, but as we'll see, that doesn't play out. The hallway offers Xavier a Negan bat, and he takes it to heart, deciding to go it alone. Addison finds a large flashlight. In the living room, Xavier tries the tiny key on the front door, but it denies him satisfaction. Jonas picks up the key, and we head back into Jigsaw's personal life coach training sessions with Eric Matthews. Jigsaw starts the game with Matthews. I want to play a game and promises that if Matthews can survive this conversation, he'll find his son inside a pun. If you do that long enough, then you will find your son in a safe and secure state. Jigsaw then dives into a diatribe about how his victims aren't victims. The Jigsaw piece he takes from them says they're missing their survival instinct. It's all really interesting. This is all really, really interesting, John. See? John thinks Matthews has forgotten how to live but is also subtly criticizing him for his poor police work. I think Jigsaw might be ACAB. Back in the house, Xavier uncovers that the exit is very unexitable. Unlike the rest of the scrap metal covering the windows, that is some seriously organized metal bars across those double doors. The uniformity, the cleanliness, I'm gonna say that's an installation job with new parts. If we're just going by materials, my estimate is around $800. Some more Scooby-Doo snooping shows us a chained and locked metal gate at the back, as well as a secret entrance to the basement, the spookiest room in any abandoned house. Down in the Blair Witch Hole, we find our next puzzle room, the furnace. A mannequin, another frickin' mannequin, sits in a wheelchair with a knife in its chest. I haven't seen this mentioned before, but it looks like that knife is the same knife, or almost, as the knife from Scream. Cool Easter egg if true, Expense purchase, regardless. If it's the knife I think it is, contemporary prices put it at $71. Not terrible. A bit flashy, but at this point, should we really be surprised? Another micro cassette for Obi clicks on. Hello, Obi. And reveals that he helped kidnap everyone. Bullshit! Neat! Good guy Obi is told that there are two antidotes inside the furnace. One for him, and one for someone else. According to behind-the-scenes interviews, this was meant to be a crematorium, but they opted to make it a water heater instead. Given that it looks nothing like a water heater and everything like a crematorium, I decided to research crematoriums. Turns out, brand new, you can get them for around $25,500. If we're actually going with the production story that this is supposed to be a boiler, then Jigsaw modified it to behave like a crematorium with crematorium-grade parts. After talking to a few engineers, we came up with parts totaling roughly $450. Abby gets freaky with Xavier, climbs in, we see another pulley, and he reaches the antidotes at the end of the furnace. Abby's greed pulls the door shut and activates the flames that begin to creep up his body. Panic sets in and he finally notices the valve to shut off the gas. Xavier and Jonas go to break the window at the back as Abby is burning alive, but it's too late. He's dead, burned up, along with the antidotes. Meanwhile, John is giving Matthews a lesson in evolution before shifting to oncology. What do you think the cure for cancer is, Eric? What? The cure for cancer. The conversation turns deep as we're led to empathize with Jigsaw's perspective, learning that cancer and suicide pushed him to realize the potential of survival and human nature. Matthews, frustrated by Jigsaw's musings, storms off and we are sent back inside the house. It's revealed that Amanda wasn't doing a very good job with the life she was given post bear trap, sending her back into Jigsaw's clutches. Jonas emerges to tell them he found a door in a house. We found a door. And it is a door. It's also the only door that isn't locked. We can count those three locks while Laura slumps to the floor. Yep, there she goes. After some intense shoulder checking on the door, Xavier pushes it open to find his own trap room. The door was held shut with some more of that steel cable and another pulley. 
which upon forcing open the door, activates the timer embedded in another big honkin' door. I get to charge Jigsaw for another fancy door, as well as that timer, and the mechanism to open and lock the door, and yet another micro cassette, this time for Xavier. Hello, Xavier. I want to play a game. The tape reveals his drug dealing past and all around shitty personality. Xavier doubles down on his shitty personality and opts to dodge this trap, the needle pit. Amanda looks horrified. So Xavier helps her overcome her fears by tossing her into the pit. Production notes say that this pit has around 120,000 needles in it. The average Metropolitan Hospital tosses about 2,000 needles a day. So Jigsaw only had to dumpster dive for needles for 60 days. That's doable. While disgusting, the contents of the pit are free. What's not free is the pit itself. I'm seeing clean cut sheet metal affixed in a pit that's maybe three feet deep, large enough to be covered by a twin frame bed. I'll be generous to Jigsaw and only charge $150. We also get a shot of security camera number three. And after some fun in the needle pit, Amanda finds the key attached to a syringe filled with glowing fluid. That'll be one glow stick, Mr. Saw. Amanda passes the prize, but Xavier fumbles the catch and the door is locked tight. Everyone feels really good about this, except Xavier. He wants to go solo again because that serves him pretty well. Back in the Puzzle Master's lair and flanked by two more CRTs, the coppers decide to play rock, paper, scissors with Jigsaw. The cops play paper, but Jigsaw's steely gaze cuts through their attack and he wins the round. Jigsaw takes pity on the cops and teaches them how to search a crime scene, directing them to look in some drawers in his game room. They find a bunch of police reports where it's revealed that Matthews was a bad cop? He framed everyone in that house, and his son is stuck in a house with all those convicts. Oops. Back in the house, Xavier finally gets a clue as his final brain cells start to fire. Everyone has a number written on the back of their neck. I'll say this was written down with markers, multicolor pack, probably semi-permanent. Xavier murders Jonas horrifically while Laura is dying in the hallway. She points out a frame on the wall that's hiding a super Photoshop picture of Daniel and his dad, Matthews. The group realizes what brings them all together, and then Laura dies. Xavier gets to the numbers while Amanda and Daniel run to the safe room. Back at the lab, Matthews throws down with Jigsaw by literally throwing him down. Addison finds the final trap room, a suspended glass box with razor blade wrist guards. She spoils the antidote and starts to bleed out, just in time for Xavier to get her number. That glass box ain't cheap to construct no matter how you slice it. <laughs> so we'll say it's around $1,100 for those cuts, fixtures, and careful assembly. Then there's the cost of the antidote and those four little lights in the corners. Back to Jigsaw's evil lair, it's game over for Matthews. Game, game over. And Jigsaw concedes to take Matthews to the house, but just him. This is meant to be an intimate evening. Matthews activates the secret elevator room and the two descend to the fate that awaits. Jesus, what a drop. Goon Squad have a lock on a house as well and roll out to the location. We're now in a race to the finish. Xavier rushing to get Daniel and Amanda, Detective Riggs with the cavalry, and John and Matthews soon pulling up to another horror movie reference. It's the last house on the left. Jonas has one more gift of kindness for the group. His blood reveals the outline of a trap door, unlocked with the little key from the beginning. Silly goobers. Xavier meatheads his way through the door just as Amanda and Daniel descend into a transition, to Jigsaw handing Matthews yet another key. The sentimental key pains John to let it go. Uh. Things get even tighter now as everyone's stories begin to collide. Xavier chases Amanda and Daniel down into a basement tunnel disconnected from the furnace room as Detective Matthews is sweeping the house. Outside, Riggs and his men are beginning to storm the house under Detective Carey's watchful eye. Before we go any further, we need to talk about that tunnel. Without giving away where it leads, that tunnel has a very specific destination, and the fact that it connects under the house via a secret trap door is also specific and determined. I don't know how many of you have secret tunnels under your house, but I can think of one person, Colin Furs. He spent the last few years building a tunnel from his garden shed to his kitchen. 
Now, he's never stated publicly how much he spent building his tunnel system, but a Redditor kindly did some modern math on the materials Mr. Furs used. Based on his reckoning, Furs' 12-foot tunnel cost $46,128 in materials. The tunnel we see under Jigsaw's house is, well, bigger. I'll give Jigsaw the benefit of the doubt and say that it connects to some pre-existing structure, maybe some other underground maintenance tunnels. But we're still looking at a passage that's at least six feet wide and at least eight to 10 feet high. Even if there were only a 12 foot section, it would not be unreasonable to charge twice as much for materials here. That's $92,256. If we work backwards for inflation, we're still left with an astounding $58,538.79. And let's be honest, that's being generous. We don't know how much more of this tunnel Jigsaw built. The fact remains that he barbarians his way into the final confrontation of the film, and it cost him $10,000 more than a Tesla Model Y. Right. Back to Amanda and Daniel's 30 left turns down into the money pit that is the conclusion of Saw 2. Riggs has busted through the front door, but Carrie can't spot him on the monitors. Amanda and Daniel reach a door and were greeted with that oh-so-familiar blue hue of despair. It's the bathroom from the first Saw film in all its rotting glory. Matthews finds Jonas's body, as well as the safe opened and a used antidote on the floor. Xavier stumbles into the bathroom, committed to get his antidote. Realizing he needs his own number, he opts to do what he must to survive. He cuts off the back of his neck, peeling the skin away to reveal his lucky number. As he approaches Amanda and Daniel, his throat is slit by Daniel with Gordon's used saw. The two watch Xavier bleed out on the floor as Matthews approaches the bathroom door. Riggs, still not appearing on Carrie's screens, approaches a table draped in satin. Ripping the satin off reveals an extensive broadcast system currently streaming the trap house back to Jigsaw's lair. Riggs pulls another sheet off a stack of VHS players and presses pause. The feed to one of the cameras in front of Carrie freezes and the reality begins to unfold. It's not live. Let's break down what we're looking at. There's seven lit up CRT monitors and one dark. On the desk, there's four VHS tapes. We can keep those with the set that Jigsaw bought back at the beginning of the film. Under another nearby satin sheet are the stack of VHS players. I was able to identify two of them as Zenith VCS 410s. The other five unknown VHS players I'll tally up at approximate cost. We can also tally the last three security cameras here for good measure. Let's go ahead and toss in those two lamps as well. And finally, we're gonna need seven computers for streaming these VHS players. Really expanding on Zep's setup while also removing Zep from the equation. Automation, am I right? Not making my job any easier. Riggs and Carrie freak the heck out, understandably, and realize they've been played. Matthews enters the dark bathroom and gags, understandably. His flashlight passes over the corpse pretending to be Adam and finds a fresher hand, but it's not his son. It's pig face with a tranquilizer. Matthews passes out and the timer ends, revealing Daniel to be in a safe place. Get it? Because he's in a safe! I'll charge for the second safe, the sedative used on Daniel, and his oxygen supply while interred. Matthews grasps himself awake, coming to find a final micro cassette player. But the voice is not Jigsaw's. Hello, Eric. It's Amanda calling out Matthews for his dirty, dirty cop behavior. She credits her new dad, Jigsaw, for becoming a better maniac. What is the cure for cancer, Eric? The cure for death itself? The answer is immortality. Amanda is intent on carrying on Jigsaw's legacy. She was in on the game the whole time, keeping Daniel safe until Matthews could be tested. Having failed, Matthews finds himself chained in the bathroom of judgment, Amanda's first test subject. Game over. The movie ends, a very pleased yet bloody John Kramer becoming smaller on screen. No! Ah! Ah! No! So, 
How did Jigsaw do? Did his Brady Bunch house produce results worthy of its budget? Or did his inflated expense account and cure for cancer send him into moral and literal bankruptcy? Let's see. In total, Jigsaw spent approximately $114,765.15. That's just under 19 times the amount spent in the first Saw film. The most expensive thing on that list is undeniably his underground tunnel to the bathroom, followed by his decision to manufacture sarin gas. Someone's feeling industrious. His cheapest items were a hanging light bulb and a single glow stick, each for a dollar. Frugal where it counts. I too have bought a glow stick and a light bulb, though not at the same time. Anyway, Saw 3 is next, and I'll be surprised if we can beat this level of expense. He can't possibly spend more, can he? Time will tell if Jigsaw can truly foot the bill. I want to give a special shout out to Redditor Jitmaster for helping identify those ATIS CG100 document recorders and sending me down a discovery rabbit hole. You rock. Also to my buddy Kyle, chemical engineer, for helping me with understanding sarin gas. I also want to thank my FBI agent for being very understanding about all of this. And finally, I want to thank you. The past few weeks have been insane, and the response to the first Saw film was beyond incredible. We're going to be putting out even more of these videos, but just bear with me as some of these things are super hard to research and take time. I want to let you know though, I am going to be covering the entire Saw franchise, including Saw X, and I'll be doing a special video that should be ready for Christmas. Call it Saw Adjacent. After Saw, I have plans to do Scream, Godzilla, Halloween, and so much more. If there's something you want to see, let me know down below. I'm here to make stuff if you're here to watch. Thanks.